everyone, and welcome to Sports and Culture Athletes for Justice. Um, thank you all for waiting, you know, while we got started, but we have a lovely panel of guests here to tackle some real issues around athletes and activism, and we're super excited to have this conversation and a little solemn that we have to have this, still have to have this conversation, but, you know, we have some amazing folks on the line who can make a world of difference. Um, and we're excited to have this conversation. So this will be a real, a very authentic conversation. <laughs> no holes bar. We are not in the uh, on the playground um, about you know how athletes can show up and use their voice and how black people can show up and use their voice. Um, but also too for our allies watching, how you all can show up um, and use your voice. Um, so for starters. Again, we've seen a lot in the news from Kyrie to Steven Jackson to Drew Brees to the NFL to the NBA, a lot of conversation around activism and reform um, and just a lot of folks being affected by all of this news. And um, we wanted to convene this conversation with Baron, convene this conversation, thank you, Baron, <laughs> convene this conversation um, to talk about it because it's been a hell of a few weeks. Um, so we're going to address it all. And so for starter, I'll start with an intro of myself. Um, I'm Simone Banna. I'm strategic partnerships manager at Focus on Sports at Twitch. We are a live streaming platform. Some of you may be watching on Twitch. Um, and again, I focus on sports bringing more personalities and just different sport le sports leagues into the platform, but very passionate about how we all use our voice through media to make change. So again, we'll go around. We have a bit of a packed house today. Um, so we'll keep the intro short. Um, and we may have some folks jump in. But Star, I want to start by introducing James. Um, so James Loney is an American former baseball first baseman, ranks all time in Dodgers history in games played at first base at 896. And he will forever be remembered as a fan favorite and for a dramatic grand slam against the Chicago Cubs in the 2008 NL Division Series. So thank you for joining the panel today, James. Um, yeah, thank you. On thank the you guys, appreciate it. <laughs> and so what's so great is we have a number of representatives from just various different leagues as well as media and education and policy. And so on our NBA side, we'll start with Matt. Um, so Matt Barnes is a former NBA player who played 14 seasons in the NBA, having studied history at UCLA, the Sacramento native has entered the investment world as an entrepreneur with a bold vision that pushes all boundaries. Um, his brand Swish strives to educate the global population about the health, wellness, and economic benefits of CBD and THC. Um, and his foundation, Athletes Versus Cancer, in honor of his late mother, Anne, partners with research institutions and celebrities to enhance public awareness of innovative treatment methods. Um, thank you for joining this panel today, Matt. Thank you for having me. Ma'am, Baron Davis <laughs> puts it all together. Um, Baron is a former NBA player and two-time NBA All-Star who played 13 seasons in the NBA. Um, Baron is also the founder of several companies, including Business Inside the Game, who has put on this amazing event, which strives to spark ideas, collaborations, and opportunities um, between sports, media, technology, business, and culture. Um, thank you for speaking, Baron, and thank you again for convening us all today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for doing this. This is going to be amazing. I'm excited. So next we'll do Al Harrington. So Al Harrington is a former NBA player who played 16 seasons in the NBA. Um, since retiring from the NBA, Harrington has become an entrepreneur in the cannabis industry. Um, Al worked with a team of industry leaders to create Viola Inc., a cannabis business named after his grandmother that positively impacts communities by reinvest reinvesting into those that were most affected by the war on drugs. Thank you for joining the panel today, Al. Yep, thanks for having me. Um, 
on the WNBA <laughs> side, because again, we had to represent for the women too. Uh, we have Monique Billings. Uh, Monique uh, Billings is a WNBA player for the Atlanta Dream. Ooh, ooh, I'm from Atlanta. Uh, many underestimated her talent, counted her out, but she proved everybody wrong when she was drafted by the Atlanta Dream in the 2018 WNBA draft. Always looking to inspire and empower others, Monique aims to be a voice and light for women and girls trying to figure out everyday life just like she is. Thank you for joining the panel, Monique. Thank you for having me. Next, we have Joy Taylor, another woman. So we're great to have this representation because we're going to get into this too. Um, but Joy Taylor is a radio personality and television host for Fox Sports 1. Taylor is currently the news update anchor on Fox Sports 1's The Herd with Colin Coward and previously the moderator for Fox Sports 1's studio show, Skip and Shannon Undisputed. Thank you so much for joining, Joy. We're so appreciative. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, we have Jody Armour, who is um, a widely published scholar, a popular lecturer, and a Soros Justice Senior Fellow of the Open Society Institute Center on Crime. That's a mouthful. Communities and culture. So he has also published a number of award-winning books such as Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism in various law review articles. Um, also, he has a number of forthcoming books and articles, including NIGGA, I know we're in a safe space, but NIGGA Theory, Race, Language, Unequal Justice, and the Law, and, and the Law, an article, Hate Speech, the N-Word, the Confederate Battle Flag, the Legal Lexicon, and the Politics of Meaning. This was a mouthful, y'all. I had to read this one out. <laughs> he teaches a diverse array of subjects, including criminal law, torts, and stereotypes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jody. Great to be with you. So again, thank you all for hopping on this call today. Like I said, this is a real conversation about a lot going on in our world, and we want to address the topics that other people steer from. Um, I know Baron, uh, Baron's team sent, I sent the questions and they were like, oh, you're getting straight to it. So yeah, yeah. we're about to have some real <laughs> conversations. And so that's the purpose is to have this dialogue. So first let's start, let's hop right into it. And let's start talking about this evolution of player activism. And I want to um, first talk about, talk to James a bit and then open the floor up for other people to join. Um, but most recently, a lot of people were, you know, very into Last Dance by, with Michael Jordan, and he finally addressed his comment where he says Republican buy, Republicans buy shoes too. Um, and so Twitter obviously burst into flames because people, again, we see the athletes of today, and people were always, people always think the athletes have been that way. Um, but certainly something has, has shifted. Um, so first to James. James, you're a bit of a unique case, and then we'll go to a lot of the NBA, WNBA. You're a unique case because you're talking about fans and you're talking about a league that is majority non-Black. The majority of the players are non-Black, um, but also, too, the majority of your fans are non-Black. So as a Black athlete in a league with largely non-Black fans, how has this affected the way that you use your voice um, compared to a lot of your counterparts? Yeah, I mean, I thought about that question a lot today earlier. And, you know, when you're thinking about fans and you're thinking about, you know, all the people around you, you know, obviously you want as many fans as you can, right? And so you don't want to say anything to, you know, disrupt that. You don't want to be in the media, you know, having some kind of distraction. And I think, you know, we're at an inflection point now. You're seeing so many athletes using their platform. Like they don't care what people are going to judge them. You know, a lot of white athletes are coming out. So I don't think, you know, where we're at now compared to when I played, you know, I think we're in a lot better position to, uh, to speak out. And then coming from a baseball standpoint, like you said, there's not a lot of African-American players, coaches, anything front office. So those topics don't even really come up a lot in the locker room. You know, I'm sure in the NBA locker rooms, NFL locker rooms, you know, they're getting talked about a lot more. Um, so, you know, for me, my experiences were, you know, as a young player too, you never really felt like you could really make much of an impact. You're just like, ah, you know, I can't really do much, but as I've, as I've gotten older and, I, and I've seen what's going on and all the technology that everybody's using to show us what's going on out there, you know, I think everybody um, is ready to make a change. No, absolutely. And that's a fair point. Um, and so 
for the folks in other leagues, have you all felt that you all can make take more of a stand, especially WNBA, NBA, knowing that your fans by and large look like you? Um, have you all felt that you could take more of a stand because of that? Is that empowering, disempowering? You feel like the community expects too much? Um, I would say, you know, for athletes just in general, a athletes have always been, you know, at the forefront of a lot of, you know, uh, let's call it world social causes. You know, you've seen sports. Um, you've seen countries stop wars over, you know, the Olympics and sports. And so I think for, for us, we're just a product of the evolution of, you know, the people who come before us, you know, uh, the Kareem's, the uh, uh, Muhammad Ali's, the Bill Russell's, right? These stories are one ever present and things that we've had to grow up watching, seeing and hearing. And so for us, I think that it, it, it's a great responsibility because our, uh, our fans, we are our fans and we are fans of each other. And so the opportunity, you know, to each one teach one, um, you know, has caused a lot of us, I know Matt, you know, Stack, you know, a lot of us, we've, we've been, we've been championing, you know, our causes. And I think, you know, now with media and social media, you know, we get a chance to kind of amplify that, but, you know, it's like we've had to go and do work, you know, inside the hood or do work and through our foundations in order to try and get the exposure and the notoriety. And now, you know, with everything going on, it, it's, sh it's shining a great light on the opportunities and, and the voices that athletes have. And I think just to touch on that, too, I think that, um, you know, when I just think about, like, my experience as being a professional athlete and, like, when I first came in the NBA and, you know, most of my career, like, you know, they do a, you know, they do a good job of um, continuing to make us conscious of, like, the things that we say, right? and trying to keep us censored, right? You know, it, it starts from as early as like, and they know like this bullet board material, we call it. Like, don't say nothing about the other team that they can use as fuel to beat you the next night. So it's like, they've always ingrained in us to like be very conscious of the things that we say. And I will say like, when I first came in the league, like, you know, I would never say anything that I felt like could ruffle feathers. You know what I'm saying? And I think that, you know, I think the athletes now I think that, you know, and which I'm proud of them and I'm happy to see, it's like they don't care about that now. You know what I'm saying? They're going to speak their minds. And, you know, um, you know, we have two guys, we have three guys to me that's on here that I personally know, obviously, that I feel like, you know, they were one of the first, they were like some of the guys that pioneered that, you know what I'm saying, with Stack and Matt. Like, they've always, since I've known them, like, they've always said what they wanted to say. You know what I'm saying? And no matter how it affected people, because for them it came from an authentic place and they was keeping it real. And so I can say, like, you know, just being around those guys, they actually gave me more and more confidence to be able to use my voice, you know what I'm saying, and not be so concerned with, you know, who feelings that I was going to hurt. Because, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I felt Michael Jordan when he said Republicans buy shoes too. You know what I'm saying? Like, they really just put you in that mindset where, you know, you just want, to, you want everybody to like you. You know what I'm saying? Because you feel like you're pushing a product where you need, you know, you need everybody to buy in, every color, every race, every whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I will say, like, in the beginning of my career, like, I feel like the NBA taught me to hold my tongue, you know what I'm saying, and just make sure that I always was towing the line, you know what I'm saying, and never, you know, kind of jumping on either side, just trying to stay in that place where, you know, you just kept everybody happy. And, uh, you know, and I will say that, you know, I hate that about myself now to know that I, you know, that I did that because, you know, when you see these young athletes now speaking their mind, you see at the end of the day, people respect it. People respect Matt. They respect Stat. They respect BD because they're real all the time. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as Al mentioned, myself and Jack, we've always spoke from the cuff. And it's been good and bad from a standpoint of, like Al mentioned as well, like they always want you to walk that straight and narrow. But, um, to me, it was always kind of understanding the moment and, and the platform and, and being able to speak. And this is really even before social media, just I was always been conscious of speaking for those who don't have a voice. You know what I mean? So as I've you know, continued to grow and 
you know, my platform is bigger than ever post-career. I've always taken pride in being able to speak on behalf of, uh, of the people because I came from, you know, both parents were functioning drug addicts, uh, abuse, uh, bad neighborhoods, food stamps, sharing bedrooms, moving all the time. Like that's where I came from. And I know that's a majority of where a lot of minorities come from, you know what I mean? So I was one of the lucky, you know, lucky ones that made it out, but I never forgot that. So I've always, whether it's cost me money, I used to get fined left and right by the NBA for tweeting and, and comments I made in the media. And it never really mattered to me though, because I know I was speaking for more than just myself. So it's refreshing to see now that it's almost encouraged. And uh, I've always kind of taken my hat off to the NBA, even though they kind of wanted you to walk the straight line. I feel like we had a lot more freedom than Major League Baseball in the NFL. So yeah. uh, now that, you know, it, it, it's more encouraged through all leagues, I really think kind of the NBA is at the forefront of individuals really speaking uh, their truths and, and stuff they believe in. And I think our voices go a long way, whether you agree with us or disagree with us, people hear what we have to say. Agree. And I think that's a great point. And it's a perfect segue um, into our next question, because the other thing that I want to touch on, because like you said, the NBA has had this reputation forever. Um, but when those NFL players, you know, those top black NFL players, you know, released that video to social media and they were calling for Roger Goodell to stand up for black people and condemn racism, um, given the very problematic history um, that the NFL kind of has had with Colin Kaepernick and various other um, figures. Um, I wanted to ask this question, ironically, to Baron, Matt, um, Stephen, and Al, you know, as, and I say this lovingly, as OGs in the game, <laughs> we were just talking about this, how have you witnessed social media invigorate individual player activism particularly as it relates to NBA players? Well, with me, with me, with me, I just use it as, you know, normal life. I mean, just like y'all said, I don't bite my tongue. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So I just use it as a tool to, to get the real out. I mean, basically that's just what it is because a lot of stuff is watered down and a lot of times when, you know, me and Matt be on TV, we can't say the shit we really want to say. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I think that's not not saying what you really want to say is, is a big reason why we're in a situation now, why we're still fighting to be equal, censoring ourselves for so long. You know what I'm saying? We're at the point now where we're holding everybody accountable. We're at the point now where we're not letting nobody get away with nothing. And that's why we're at the point where they're listening to us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I mean, 15 countries, I mean, 50 states, 18 countries all protesting at one time. It's never happened before. It's, they're listening because we're holding everybody accountable and, we, and we're making everybody listen. There's no supporting us from your phone or supporting us from your DMs. You have to actually come on your, come stand on my side if you say you love me and march with me. I'll stand on my side and get things done and get things changed. And that's where we at. You know what I'm saying? That's the people we are. That's the only way we're going to get stuff done. But at the same time, like me and Al was just talking, with us being standing on that side, we still got to have that voice. We still got to have that voice for somebody and to come go in there and speak and say things we need to say that need to be said the way they need to be said. You know, and, and, and everybody got a role. I know my role. My role ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? My role ain't sitting in a room with politicians and telling them what laws we need to change. You know what I mean? That ain't, that ain't my role, but... At the end of the day, we all got a role to play. You know, with me, it's a little bit more personal because it's my brother, you know? So a lot of people might not understand my stance and might not understand uh, my passion for it. You know what I mean? But it's real tears, it's real pain. So with me, it's going to be different than everybody else. You know what I'm saying? And, and I can't really say that because I know my brothers like Matt, uh, BD, and uh, Al, they hurt when I hurt. You know what I mean? So. I think we at a point now in history, just like I'm hearing from people that's been that's been fighting this fight for 50, 60 years, we at a point that we never had their ear like this. So it's something we got to take advantage of, advantage of, and can't lose. I don't have all the answers, but I see all these beautiful minds on here. Together, we can get it done in, in any way possible or whatever y'all come up with. I'm down, but we can't lose this moment. We cannot lose this moment. Yeah, and that. Is I want yeah, I wanted to touch on that real quick, too, because, you know, in today's society, the video doesn't lie. Right. Like these aren't accidents. We're seeing a guy kneel on the guy's neck for almost nine minutes. You know, we're seeing um, 
Ar uh, Arbery get shot down, you know, from a pickup truck. Like we're seeing, you know, how malicious these guys are. And there's no questions, you know, back in the day, it was like, well, was it an accident? We don't have the video. Everybody's seen it with their own eyes. So if you're not, if your heart's not feeling this, uh, you know, so you got to check yourself. No, that's a great point. And we're going to get to the real good question. This is another good one. But I, I want to touch on social media again, specifically to Monique, because um, she's the youngest <laughs> on our video. Um, and so you've seen like Generation Z kind of start coming out and kind of dominating these different platforms, especially something like a TikTok that, you know, has emerged as a platform for Black Lives Matter activism. You know, how do you think your Generation Z, as a Generation Z, or I think you are, <laughs> how do you think your generation of athletes will use social and digital media to drive individual player activism? I mean, honestly, it feels like we have each other's back on social media. And right now, while we're in quarantine, that's all we can do. All we have, other than protesting, all we have is social media. So more than ever, it feels like we have each other's back and that we're all in this together. And it's not just coming from Black people, it's white I'm people too genuinely trying to understand and trying to be mindful of the fact that, you know, I don't have black skin, I don't have brown skin, but I hear you, I see you and I love you and I want to be there for you. So I feel like the younger generation is coming together in that type of way and just trying to educate people, just really trying to put people on game who might not understand, but really want to understand the ones who genuinely want to understand. No, absolutely. And so Again, that's another segue into the, another great question, but I, I want to touch on this one. And this one really is open to everyone. Um, but I really want to, as we talk about social media, as we talk about this momentum that we have, as we talk about more people being, paying attention than ever, I want, to, I want to direct this one to Joy first because she is in media, um, but you know everyone can chime in. And so to Steven's point, millions of dollars are being poured into black community organizations. Um, the Minneapolis City Council announced they would disband the Minneapolis Police Department. The case for Breonna Taylor, an African-American woman who was gunned down in her home by police after a case of mistaken identity, has been reopened. One could say the protests are working, the anger is working, the conversations are working. Um, and so we have seen NBA players, Kyrie Irving, Dwight Howard, amongst others, um, argue um, that resuming the NBA season would distract from the Black Lives Matter movement and the momentum that it has gained. So first for Joy, as a woman in media, in media, as a person of color in media, do you believe that resuming sports will detract from the progress that the Black Lives Matter movement is making? I fully understand Kyrie's points. So I see both sides of it. I feel like if Kyrie is not comfortable with coming back or he feels like coming back will be a distraction. I understand where he's coming from, but I also feel like we all, each of us on this call have a very powerful platform, right? That we all worked very hard to get, not just so that we could do what we love, but also so that we could, you know, change the world. And a big part of this movement to me is reaching people that are outside of the echo chamber, you know, reaching people who don't understand what we're talking about on here or are resistant to talking about it, but do still love sports. Keep it in their face. Like do not, do not let up for one second where I can, I can't breathe shirt before the game. Say it in every interview. Don't even answer the interview question. Say what you want to say and then say, you know, it was a good game and then say whatever you want to say. Just, just keep the message going because life is going to continue on, right? Quarantine is not going to be forever. Sports are eventually going to come back one way or the other and the message can't stop. So to me, I'm more powerful with my platform. So I'm going to use my platform every opportunity I can to further the cause and keep the movement going. So I, I fully understand what Kyrie is saying. And, you know, if that's what makes him comfortable, I support that. But I also feel like coming, sports coming back and basketball coming back, the NFL coming back, it's all going to happen eventually. That doesn't mean that the conversation can stop. And, you know, like I said, people – or want sports back so badly, they're going to watch. All these people are saying that they're going to quit watching sports. Like, okay, we'll see. You're going to watch sports and you're going to have to listen to what everyone has to say. And to me, I think that's very powerful. I agree with Joy. Um, I hear Kyrie and, and Dwight, but I don't agree with them at all. I think for the first time in 400 years, the black voice is heard 
and more than ever, the black male athlete voice is heard and it's ringing around the world. And, and, and you know, thanks to our brother Jack and people like LeBron and, and people are working. So I think for the first time, we're on the what? Not only in sports, but as a culture as a whole. Like they hear us, what's the next step? So to me, sitting out, I'm not against sitting out, but I'm against sitting out without a plan. You know, so I've been closely talking to Chris Paul the last few days and they've been thinking of ideas to present to the owners. You know what I mean? To me, it's to a point now where we're, this is, this is what we want as players. You know, we have everything from, and I'm just talking off the top of the head from, you know, disconnecting from your local police, uh, company or you know uh police departments to work for the teams and hiring private security to starting a, you know a hundred million dollar fund um each team that gives back to the inner city but i think now is the time where we kind of attack we've never had a more powerful voice and we may never have a more powerful voice than we do now so now is the time to have our demands and then if our demands aren't met and i'm saying we because the nba is a family although i'm done playing if our demands are met that's when you sit down but to just sit out without a purpose or without a, you know, a, a let's go for the gusto, I, can, I think it completely defeats the purpose in the moment, especially realizing, like Joy said, the whole world is going to be watching the NBA. So if we sit silent, we're handing that off to the NFL. You know what I mean? And, and they're supposed to try to make something of it. So I think NBA has always been at the forefront of things. You know, when, when the NBA canceled the season, the world stopped. You know what I mean? That's how powerful I feel like the NBA is. So – I think these guys are ready to take on that responsibility and, and Chris Paul and LeBron James and the rest of these guys, I know they're going to put some great plan together, but I think now more than ever, we have to use our voice and our platforms. And I think that's most effective by getting back to playing because so many amazing things can come from that within the process. I'm yeah, a, I like I'm to. Piggy, uh oh, my Go bad. ahead, D. Go ahead, D. You got uh, it. You got it. Yeah. Right. I'm going <laughs> to piggyback off what they said, man. Uh, it took me a minute to get on a call. He just posted something saying, you know, all the black brothers in baseball. And like you said, we're in the middle of not being able to play as of a few minutes ago. Like our, our commissioner said, he don't even know if we're going to play. But we made sure we got our voices heard. You know, we made sure we put out a dope video so everybody can see, you know. Because it's like, he's, like you guys are all saying, baseball is worse. We definitely not allowed to say nothing. You know what I'm saying? This one of 60 – I'm one of 68 out of 182 people. You know what I'm saying? Like, that ain't no good number. So we definitely, I understand everything y'all saying, but we like on a tenfold of it. And we we using our platform right now. And like I said earlier, we scared as hell. We ain't never been able to do this. We don't know what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? But we definitely using it for the greater good. We appreciate that as fans. Sorry, not as <laughs> catalysts. Baron, you wanted to say something too? I think that's a great point, D. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wanted to just piggyback off Matt was saying. It's like, you know, everything we do now has has to have some structure and some planning, right? Because, you know, our voices are being heard, right? Uh, people are listening. You know, people are standing next to us. People are willing to mobilize. But, you know, all that can fail if there is, you know, no proper plan, right? And, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, uh, to stack point, um, you know, it's like we can't cheapen our voice, right? We can't cheapen our voice, but we also can't, like, cheapen our, our handout. You know what I mean? And so is you know you know you know what is a, what is a hundred million dollars to companies that generate billions and billions of dollars right that's a tax write-off you know what i'm saying and so you know you know i've, I've been kind of like just going back and researching and you know it's like when you think about where we are now right it's almost like you know the loan has come to fruition Right. And so we can no longer sit at the table and say, yeah, all right, 10, 10 million to that foundation, 100 million to over here. Oh, we're just going to like automatically just give, you know, 200 million dollars to, you know, minority businesses. Well, you know, think about the black business and what the black business is generating for those companies really to be able to give you, you know, or give you back, you know, uh, 10% of the money that you've been given to PayPal all along. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, it's all about, 
structure, structure, structure. We got to keep pushing the fight. You know, as athletes, we got to keep standing up and like using our platform and our voices and making sure that we're listening to the right people, receiving the right information, because that's a big part of, you know, to what Matt is saying, the plan, right? So we got to have micro plans, but we also have to, to be listening to the right people to come up with that master plan because there's a bigger ass, you know, and there's, you know, uh, more opportunity or, or more, more, um, more resources and economic benefits than just, you know, looking, looking for what is the quick monetization in the way out. Absolutely. And we're going to get into, again, like I said, this is a panel one to discuss what's going on in this world, but we're going to be really going to tap into you, Professor Jody Armour to talk about, again, how do you institutionalize this and start creating real change? Before we get to kind of talking about action, because Baron, you make great points, and I want to make sure we dedicate enough time to that. Um, what I think about often is, again, I think about, again, let's, like I said, it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind of headlines. So I think about somebody like a Drew Brees who comes out, puts his foot in his mouth, and sounds crazy about, you know, people disrespecting the flag during this time. So this is a question to all panelists. Again, everybody didn't have to answer, but feel free for people who feel strongly. You know, what role do you think your white teammates, white general managers, and white owners play in this conversation? What do you want from them? Allyship. You want real allies. You want you want white folks. Uh, I see her out here in L.A. You have white people for black for Black Lives who get on the front line, organize put in a lot of work, put in a lot of effort. Um, you had somebody like Chelsea Handler uh, do a Netflix uh, uh, documentary last year, use my class at USC as part of that, Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea, and where she was grappling with this very same issue. What, the, what is the role of a white ally, or beyond even a white ally, a white accomplice who's trying to promote black equality and liberation in these times that we're in. So yeah, defining allyship. And now I'll let some other folks take it up from there. What, what does it mean to be a white ally? It means to stand up. Uh, every teammate I've had have asked me, you know, what can I do? I mean, that's, shoot, that's all I keep telling me. Honestly, we done made it here without your help. Just stand up. You know, we already know how to fight. We already know what we need to do to stay here. We know we can't say this, we can't say that. But when you hear somebody say something that you know messed up, stand up or you win them. And that just is what it is. And I think communicating in the right way too, right? Because, you know, tensions are high a lot of times when these things happen and everybody wants to go at each other kind of hard. It's like, no, know how to communicate, you know, with certain type of people. And I think that's how you start the conversation. And so to Matt, too, I'm going to call Matt out for a second, because um, you recently posted a graphic to your social media so, talking about all the owners who donated to Trump's campaign. So what do you want to see from these owners? Um, uh, something real, something that's not just PR face driven to say face. You know what I mean? I think so much they just try to sap, scratch, scratch the surface, not realizing how much money these teams make in every city. You know, obviously they drive revenue, but they make a lot of revenue off the city as well. And, and these people paying their hard earned money to be a part, you know, to be a fan at, at these sporting events. You know, the owners, if we're going to keep it real, are some good old boys, most of them, you know, especially in the NFL, Major League Baseball, a handful of them in the NBA. It's just <laughs> that's only the 70 year old oil money, real estate money, and they have a certain way. And we've always given them a pass for being, oh, you know, that's just their generation, but that it's not that time no more. You know, the, uh, the NBA is 75% African American, the NFL is 68% African American. Like, we move the needle. You know, so it's now it's time for you to really sit back up all these all the money you make off us in, in these cities to really do something that's going to be lastful and impacting. You know, I got a chance to talk to the, um, you know, Rob Palenka from the Lakers gave me a call and kind of was strategizing with me how the, you know, the Lakers can be most effective in making a, an impactful movement. Um, during this process and that was the first thing I told them I was just like well first of all it's a loaded question give me some time to think but you, I was like I was like it just can't be to save face you know what I mean um, like someone else touched on now it can't be a, a PR move it's a you know we're with black people we're with black players and then once the season starts the playoff comes everyone forgets about that 
It has to be something that's, that's lastful, that's impactful, that really involves the community and, uh, and, and really helps because, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, players shouldn't play in these sports and let's hit the owners where, you know, hit them in their pockets. This is a hobby for these owners. You know what I mean? Like this is their, 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 their survival is not based off the money they make off, off sports, you know? So we have to have another plan and we have to push the, push the envelope. You know, so I think I hope the NBA and I know they will. Like I said, I've been talking to Chris. They're going to come with a list of demands that need to be met. And if these demands aren't met, aren't met then these guys don't play. Don't play. You know, but like I said, we should go for everything we can right now because the, our voice has never been more powerful. I also think, well, I think it's two things. One, there need to be more black people in positions of power, more black executives, more black <laughs> Uh, more black staff and in, in my business there need to be more black producers certainly more more black uh, executives decision makers you got to be in the room so don't just say that you're advocating you you have the option you have the ability and the power to hire black people for those positions so do that that's not a difficult thing to do and then the second thing to me and that goes for media that goes for sports everything um, the second thing to me is it's more to what Dee is talking about, which is there needs to be those grassroots conversations. We're not with you with your family and your crazy uncle saying wild stuff at family dinner. You're the one that has to check them. You're the one that has to have that conversation with your friend when they say something that's racist. Make sure they know that you're not for that and that you're not going to be cool with them moving forward. You're not going to keep making excuses for those actions and that conversation and that way of living, like it's done. That's a wrap for them and for you and for your relationship. And if that means you gotta cut some family off, it might just be time to do that. But if you really believe that, if you're really out here being an advocate, if you're really marching in the street, you really wanna live that, you have to do those things. And it's, it shouldn't really be difficult to do, but that's to me, that's the, that's the heart of it. That's the start there. Agree. And I think those are both very valid points. And so, Last question, and then we can, not last question, but the last question before we get into, okay, what do we do? Um, August 19, NFL announced it will be entering a multi-year partnership with Rock Nation to amplify the league's social justice efforts, like we talk about PR. Um, so Jay-Z and Rock Nation received a backlash for the partnership, um, and Jay-Z was quoted saying, I think we're past Maryland, I think it's time for action. And so as we get into this topic of, okay, what should we be doing? Do you agree or disagree with Jay-Z? Are we past nailing? Is it time for action? And if you agree with Jay, you know, what should athlete activism look like instead? I think we've lost, uh, to, to touch a little bit on that, I think the meaning of the kneel has lost its, its fire and veracity from a standpoint of, you know, Cap took a knee four years ago and was blackballed. Everyone looked at him, talked crazy about him from media to you know, people in the league around the world. And now four years later, we're under, or we knew, but the people that didn't understand are understanding why he was kneeling. So now you see cops kneeling, but you see cops kneeling one day. And then later in the day, we'll see on social media, they're still kicking people's ass and killing other people, you know? And now you see Roger Goodell giving a half-ass apology, but not addressing the man that he blackballed, you know what I mean? And telling players it's okay to kneel now, which I think is bullshit. Cause if you weren't kneeling in 2016, I don't want to see you kneel in 2020. There's nothing at, there's nothing at stake now. You mean? So I, I really feel that the knee has lost its cause and its purpose. Um, so I guess what Jay-Z said is we're past kneeling. I don't know if he knew what, what the knee would take from there, but I, we are past. So it, now it's action, you know, now, not only in sports, but I'm, you know, kind of repeating myself, not only in sports, but in life, like what's next. We have the world's attention. So we have to definitely organize, strategize. And one thing I think the black community is, has always been our, our, our weakest fault is we're kind of on islands. You know what I mean? In, in, in certain packs, but we're never really together like other cultures are. And I think if we came together and realized our power, black and brown people, if we came together and realized our power, we can really change the ship. You know what I mean? We can really start affecting change on the local level, state level, and federal level. Because, you know, we have that kind of power if everyone buys in and understands it and starts to educate themselves. And I'm sure we're going to get there next. But just on voting and, and, and the whole political process and, and understanding that, you know, where things happen and how we can directly affect that. Okay, great answer. <laughs> so let's, let's go um, to, again, talking action. And so my first question is for Professor Armour. Um, 
we talked about all these corporations donate money. NFL donated two hundred fifty million. Jordan Brand donated money. Nike is donating forty million. Um, if you could advise on how this money should be spent, how would you prioritize allocating this money to push reform? Yeah, well, what we've learned over the last several weeks is that all of the fixes that we thought were going to solve the problem of police brutality didn't do a thing. I wrote this book that you were talking about back in 1997, Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism and Hidden Costs of Being Black in America, about these same issues we're talking about today. And since I wrote that book, don't look like, you know, ain't nothing changed but what year it is, right? The same set of issues, the same, and here's how it works every time with these issues. Well, there'll be a hashtag, whether it's Tamir Rice, whether it's Trayvon Martin, whether it's Walter Scott, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, you name the hashtag, and there'll be some people who convene a commission, there'll be wringing of hands, there'll be a town hall meeting, people will come and vent, then all these policymakers will say, okay, I have the fix, here you go, uh, how about body cameras? How about, okay, implicit bias training? Here comes another hashtag. How about de-escalation training? Here comes another hashtag. Community policing, here comes another one. None of them solved the issue. None of them, uh, uh, in Minneapolis, they had all of that going on and more, right? And you still had not only the cop with his knee on George Floyd's neck, but the other three standing back and letting him do it, showing you it wasn't just about a few bad apples, right, anymore. And you had, by the way, a city council 14, of, 14 total, 13 of which are Democrats, and one was a Green Party. So you can't get any more liberal than the city council. The mayor's Democrat. Every, the, the police the chief, the chief of police, is Democratic. So, you know, all of the interventions we thought, you know, cast a ballot and, get, and that'll make a difference. You know, all these other interventions, they don't make a difference. Now we're to the point where we realize what the real problem is. The real nitty-gritty issue is black lives don't matter. Black lives have not mattered since the, from the inception of this country. It was founded by slaveholders, right, who were celebrating liberty and democracy, and um, people like me were chattel. And then we had a cataclysmic race war called the Civil War, 600,000 dead Americans. Then that we went right from there to Jim Crow, another 100 years of racial apartheid in America. Then after that, you walk down Skid Row here in L.A., it's the fiercest expression of structural violence in America, right? I mean, we're talking about the highest concentration of homeless people in America. You look to your families, everything. You look to your left, you look to your right, what do you see? 75% of them are black. Not people of color. Not 75% people of color, 75% black. You go into the jails where I take my students into San Quentin, Terminal Island, you take them to jails and prison, it looks like the same demography. You think you're on skid row in terms when you look at the, the demographics, right? You look at COVID-19 and who it's disproportionately hitting, right? Because of things like asthma, environmental racism, um, hypertension, stress of living in America under a racist system, um, you know, things like uh, diabetes, that's the food deserts, right? So over and over, we've seen that black lives just don't matter and we have to get them to start mattering. And that, I'm not gonna answer your question. What do we need to do to get people to act like black lives matter, right? We have to say that number one, we in the black community are going to wrap our arms around the truly disadvantaged blacks in our community. You know, Chris, the reason my book is titled Nigger Theory, and I hate to use that blood-soaked epithet, right, right now, but the reason it's named that is one of the reasons is Chris Rock launched his comedic career with a routine called Bring the Pain, in which he goes back and forth in the late 90s in front of an all-black audience with the following line. It's like a civil war going on in black America, and there's two sides. There's black people and there's niggas. And niggas have got to go. I love black people, but I hate niggas. Boy, I wish they let me join the Ku Klux Klan. Should I do a drive by from here to Brooklyn? And he goes on like that for 30 minutes talking about so-called N-words, right? And what's his core definition of a so-called N-word? A black person who's done a crime. So by that definition, and all the people are laughing, amening and preach and all the rest, by that definition, the up to 90% of young black males who in some of these in neighborhoods are gonna wind in, up in jail, on probation, on parole at some point in their lives, are N-words, we we're doing that to our own community. 
So right. we start playing that kind of game, right? We got to get clear on that. We got to embrace the people down in Skid Row. We got to embrace the brothers in the prison. We got to embrace, you know, number one, we got to, we all we got. Ourselves. Yep. We all we got. Starting there and then talk about massive reinvestment, taking money from police, reinvesting so that we don't have Skid Row. So I'll kind of stop there but, and, and get to more later. No, that's that 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 gives me fired up because everything that you're talking about is is self ownership, right? And so we have to come to the table and we have to mobilize within ourselves and help help us fix our problems, right? And so, you know, um Matt was saying like we click up, right? If we all come together, you know what I mean? Like we gotta create the institution that we all can look towards and say, hey, if I am channeling my energy, my resources, my finances to this institution, then we can be more powerful in our cliques, right? Because we can now go and we have a, a, a higher platform, right? A higher financial institution, a higher educational system, right? A higher uh, standard of living, right? That we abide by a pay it back, a pay it forward, uh, you know, erase the homelessness, right? The, uh, you know, really be about prison reform. And now when we get the dollars, right, we can institutionalize those dollars the way America has institutionalized us to go out and chase dollars, right? To continue to feed this American beast, right? So, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, I would say like, how do we, how do we get there is by trying to understand what is it, right? If there are no reparation checks, right? How do we reparate ourselves and say, this is our institution, right? How do we start to break down the fabrics of the institutions that have been holding us back and say, hey, okay, we're going to do that one here in LA. We're going to do that one there in Sacramento. We're going to do that one there in New Jersey, right? Um, how do we start to really just tear apart and, re and stitch ourselves the way that we're built off of, right? And realigning our values, our morals, our laws, and holding ourselves to a higher esteem right and a higher measure of what success is not monetary right but the invaluable intangibles of of who we are as a people then we can create that ultimate value right as a community and that's my two cents agree and you bring up a great point and i try to preach it to everybody but they act like you crazy when you talk about self-ownership um, it's super important that we invest in ourselves. And that's why I love Reebok's statement. Again, we know it's all PR, man. But I love Reebok's statement where they were like, we wouldn't, we would not have, we wouldn't be anything without the Black consumer. And so when we talk about ownership. It's so important that we reorient the money that we're spending yeah. into our own. Um, and I think that's a great point. And that's something I'm particularly very passionate about. But, you know, I want to hear from you all, you know, what are you all passionate about in terms of re reform and what are you advocating for and why? I was thinking, um, you know, with, with some of the instances we've seen lately, you know, when, you, when you're getting a police call for a counterfeit bill or you're getting a police call, you know, for a mental health problem, we don't need guys running down there with guns, you know, guns blazing and, and we need an entity that is calm, no weapons that can handle those situations that are trained for those situations. Cause the police are, you know, they're trained, they're trained to kill and then they get in situations and they get scared. You know what I mean? So I feel like we need programs that are made for, you know, for less dangerous situations like we've seen lately. And real quickly, that's what people really mean when they say defund the police. Some people are right. trying to misconstrue the meaning of that and, 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 and um, characterize it like they're trying to say abolish the police. In some no. black communities, we're only getting forced to the murder solved, right? Rapes are only being solved at a, a rate of 20%. They have rape kit backlogs that pat, you know, in warehouses because they're not processing them. Why? They're out changing. Why? Because they're out ch uh, chasing turnstile jumpers. 
They're out chasing people for $20 counterfeit bills. They're cracking right. down on the down and out. Quota. Yeah, they're cracking down on the down and out here in, home, in, in, in a skid row, right? Try, so-called therapeutic policing. All that money needs to be diverted to social programs, to social workers, to, 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 to affordable housing, to do something with the crumbling schools. And then you, you don't, police don't need to be street level social workers. You don't want your social worker come, arriving at your doorstep with a gun, a stun gun, mace, a billy club, and, and, and handcuffs. That, that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a social worker, but that's what role we're putting police in. And that's what they mean by defund the police. Get the money out of police doing that sort of thing and give it to people whose job description really know what they're doing. It's, it's part of their wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, police funding in majority of major cities is, is, is a bulk of the budget. You know, in LA, it's 20% of the budget while all of the businesses only get eight at most. You know what I mean? So reorganizing, I think they hijacked the movement like they're good at doing uh, when there was no clear cut definition of what defunding the police was. Oh, you guys want anarchy and we don't want cop. No, we don't want that. We just don't want race in it no more. You know what I mean? That's what we want. And then also, like I said, allocating funds. We got, I guess by definition, they have cops doing everything. You know, that's just what you call 911 now and it's non-emergency situations. But if you're black, your life is in danger at that point. You know what I mean? So you almost hesitate to call. So I think re uh, re uh, allocating funds and having specialists in, in, in these positions. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough, you know, I have aspirations of possibly being the mayor one day of Sacramento. So I've really been doing a lot of groundwork up there and talking with bill makers and, 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 and politicians up there. And, and they say the the two strongest unions are the police union and the, the, the education of teachers union. And that's why kids don't learn shit and cops do what they want. You know what I mean? So if anything needs to be abolished and rebuilt, it's the unions, you know, the police union, because these guys are, you know, that they're, they're protected. It's a way to hide money. Yeah. It, it, these guys are so protected. You know, I read something that said uh, 1% of, of cops that kill civilians are charged and less than 1% are actually convicted. So, I mean, it's a free pass. You know, you want to legally kill a black person, become a cop. And that's what it's pretty much turned into, which is unfortunate. So I think we definitely need to be able to allocate, uh, reallocate funds to health specialists for non-emergency things and then really take a look at, at their unions because the unions is, the, is that blue shield that keeps these guys feeling untouchable. You know what I mean? In the George Floyd case, this guy had his hand in his pockets with an invincible look on his face because he knew shit wasn't going to happen to him. You know, at the end of the day, you, you see the, the one time that cops are made examples of are when they're minority cops and do something wrong. Those are the cops that will get in trouble and disciplines and sentenced. But when, with the white cops that kind of just do what they want and bully people and do they get away with it because 9.8 times out of 10, they're going to get off of it. You know, who, get, who gets to kill someone and gets, gets, you know, sent home on paid vacation? Why they, why, you know, why they, why they look at, uh, you know, why they look at the facts, you know? And I was talking with Jack earlier. Just think how much they've tried to lie in this George Floyd situation. Like we didn't see the tape. You know what I mean? They tried to taint the narrative, blame drugs, blame underlying heart conditions, <clears throat> blame he was resisting arrest. But we all saw that. So think about when there was no body cam that we just had to take the words of these officers. It's, it's insane, you know? So I think uh, uh, I read an article also about Camden, New Jersey in 2012 or 13, um, uh, defunded their police and kind of re like broke them down and rebuilt them. And now they said since then that the crime rates have dropped, you know, the, 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 the police officer more visible in the communities. A new officer has to go door to door in the community, knock on the door, introduce themselves, ask how they can help, what, what, they, what the community feels like they can do to help, you know, pop up barbecues, movie nights. I just think we need to get to a point where the police are more visible in these communities and possibly start, you know, with all the funding we have, let's start funds where they actually are going into Compton and Inglewood and, and Watts and recruiting people to be cops and teaching them and training them because when you come from those communities, the normal stuff that might scare a quote unquote typical white cop won't scare someone because they're accustomed right. to they know their neighborhoods, they know how to talk, they know how to de-escalate situations, but you're putting white guys quote unquote from the valley in the hood and they're walking around with their hand on their gun, you know, so we don't even have a chance. So I think there has to be more, you know, possible funding programs that recruit minorities in these, in these particular neighborhood so they can learn how to be a cop because I'm sure they would want to be if there was an opportunity to be and police their own neighborhoods because the we fear what we don't know and that's on both sides we don't know them so we're scared and they don't know us so they're scared and most of the time it ends up in us dying so we have to figure out a way to 
you know, strategically place money in certain situations, educate these people better and have professionals for these non-emergency events. Yeah, I've heard cops, I mean, even uh, minority cops, a lot of them get sent to be correctional officers, you know, so they're, they're still finding a way to put them in jail. So hopefully, um, you know, hopefully that changes too. To Jody's point earlier also, I, I, I think you have to take the shame out of the struggle. So, you know, everyone on the call isn't, you know, doesn't have a huge platform or millions of dollars to donate or the influence to, you know, reach people that can help take apart police reform and, you know, to make all those major changes. You can go out into your community and volunteer and that's free. You can go to Skid Row in, in, in LA and, you know, help, help people right there face to face. And that like, that takes nothing but time. So helping the community on a very grassroots level is, is super important as, as far as all the macro things that we're talking about as well. Every, every piece of it plays a role. I think those are all great points. Anybody else? Prosecutors, just ask the prosecutors out there, think about prosecutors. They, are, they wield a lot of power. They don't, they don't pro, like Jackie Lacey here in LA, does not prosecute killer cops, right? Uh, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, he got 75% of the people of Philadelphia vote, to vote for him in the general election. He'd only been a public defender and defense attorney beforehand, and his platform was end cash bail, end um, police misconduct, and end racialized mass incarceration. Got 75% of the people of Philadelphia to vote him into office on that platform. These are new times, right? People are starting, Chase Boudin up in San Francisco, another progressive DA. Right, so we got to do that in some place like like L.A. You know, Black Lives Matter has been saying Jackie Lacey must go. Right, we got to see how important the prosecutor is. The top cop in any jurisdiction, and, yeah. and, and Jackie Lacey has gotten 2.2 million dollars from police unions. So how 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 zealously is she going to go after a cop when she's when yeah. her campaign is turning on those contributions? So that's yeah. another part of the puzzle. And I think too when we talk about voting obviously in the highest level and you know wherever people are in politics uh, you know uh, to me both sides do dirty shit both sides do stuff i like but it's not so much i mean obviously i think it's important to be united on anybody but trump in the office and that's a whole longer conversation but i think what we have to start doing is challenge ourselves to edu educate ourselves on the local and state levels because that's where bills are created and passed and that's stuff we can directly effect you know so you don't have to know politics is a lot and i've been taking a crash course of late and it's 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 mind-blowing but i'm enjoying the process but at the same time it's not even if you feel like your voice isn't heard or the, the suppression or whatever there's things that you could do on your local level when you're voting for like you said the da the prosecutor the judge the the, the sheriff there's things that we can vote for so that to me it's it's take things in bite-sized pieces politics is a lot and i'm working on a, um, a project right now to make politics sorry there's a helicopter make politics fun to learn and, and, and easy, you know, we're, we're, so we're working on a process where we can teach anyone from kids to adults and just understanding the power you have at your local and state level. And it's as simple as, you know, picking a few issues you're passionate about and go out and tell your friends and vote on those issues. So that at that point you're registered, you're starting to learn the process and more and more you can kind of feed yourself with the knowledge you need to understand on your local and state level. But I think people, when they think voting, it's just the president and it's so much more than that. The local and state levels where the laws are made and passed, uh, you know, for our states is very important um, when it comes to especially these police bills. I've been working on a lot of a lot of police procedure stuff. We got a bill passed last year called AB 392, which is a police procedure bill that went in the, um, the beginning of, of this year. And it's a bill where, you know, police must exhaust every other trained tactical option before admitted, uh, administering deadly force. But that was a bill that was passed, you know, in, in Sacramento and we got it, you know, ar ar around the state. So there's a lot we can do as just day-to-day -day citizens because um, a lot of people feel their voices aren't heard on the highest level with the presidency, but there's stuff you can do on your state level that directly affect the way we live. Piggyback off of that, I really like what you said about taking it in bite-sized pieces and smaller pieces. I've never even thought of it that way, but I feel like that's a way to encourage people. That definitely just encouraged me, so thank you for that. Well, I think it's just things like, you know, so when you look on what's going on, there's certain policies that everyone is passionate about. You just don't know that they're out there to vote on. You know what I mean? So like I said, chat, I know we all have crazy lives when we're normally on this hamster wheel, but I think what the pandemic has done has been able to kind of get us off our wheel appreciate things, but just you have time to learn stuff, you know? So we have to challenge ourselves to understand how powerful we are. One, if we become united, but then two, if we actually take voting seriously, like we have the demographic and the numbers 
to really change. Republicans count on us just not voting. And that's how they get a lot of their shit passes because they're figuring we're not gonna vote. So we have to change that narrative first and foremost that it could be as small as voting on one issue. All great points. And so before we get- um, I, was, I would like to just say what I'm working on for this issue. All right. Um, I just had to get some clearance. Um, <laughs> Uh, so actually during COVID, we were thinking about, you know, just ways to, uh, hire security, hire, um, you know, bouncers, people like that. And so we're working on a platform called Brigade and we turn that into a post, uh, police accountability app. So think about an Uber that, you know, instead of, you know, uh, the thought was around, rest in peace, George Floyd, was if if they could pull out their camera and record, if they could pull out their camera and hit a button and a brigade citizen pulls up, that brigade citizen has every right to get that police off of, you know, um, make sure that that police is held accountable for doing his job. And so to like what everybody's been saying, about the police, it's like we have to start to take the ownership into our own hands, right? And start to build tools. And for me, it's about building the tool and building the resource where now we can start holding the police accountable, right? We can start employing our own. We can start encouraging more, you know, African American Black people to sign up to be cops, to sign up to be prosecutors, right? We have to, like, we have to use the fact that we're institutionalized and institutionalize ourselves within our own ecosystem, right? Because that is how we kind of carve out our own initiative and our own, you know, America, which we deserve. I think, too, real quick, since we're kind of talking about where we're going, I love that, Baron. Uh, but we're working on an app where you can punch in your zip code and kind of see what the local climate is as far as who's running for what what the policies are their background and unbiased background the good bad in between and so you really just know what what date you need to turn out who's running for it and, and, and issues like I said it could start with one issue you know uh, up to however many issues you want to vote for because I think we just have to understand it's it, it's a lot to swallow at once but bit by bit and making it fun uh, you know we're animating stuff we're doing you know short edits we're doing just powerful, bold messages with statistics underneath it. I think there's, you know, there's, there's ways where we can slowly but surely understand the game that we were never meant to be a part of in the first place. You know, we were ne never meant to be equal. We were never meant to be on the same playing field. And the fact that we are now, the only way they can stop us is killing us. You know, so we have to beat them. Obviously, for the first time in 400 years, they're listening. And that's because they kind of felt they felt our pain. We burned shit down. They stole whatever. And I don't agree with all that. But at the same time, the peaceful stuff has never worked. So they finally hear us now. So I think now when they say, what do you want? We just have to be prepared. And I think that starts mentally or that, that, that starts with our mind and then starts with a strategic plan and understanding the, 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 this, this, the politics and, and the voting game. Absolutely. And I, and I think those were all great solutions and different answers. And we're going to try to wrap up because I know we're a little bit past time. But I do, I do want to say, I do want to ask again, Stephen, given your proximity to George Floyd and what has happened, you know, what should we as society, again, we're going to do a roundup question, but for Stephen specifically, what should, like, what should we as society, what is the change that people want to see in Minnesota? So how can we say, okay, we accomplished what we needed to accomplish when it comes to George Floyd and the murder of George well, Floyd? Well, about it, in Minnesota, it's bigger than my brother. It's bigger than George Floyd. As I've, I've, as I've been out there the last, what, 14 days, I think I've met at least six mothers that y'all never heard of that sons have been killed by police. Mm. So, so, and they don't have a Stephen Jackson to speak up for them. You know, so, so I think, I think me being there, it, it opened up something, it was only God, because it opened up a passion in me that I never thought that I'll have. You know, um, the people in Minnesota just want justice, and that, that, that they're tired of getting treated like animals. Uh, they're tired of the, the, the mayor, the police chief, all being in cahoots, and, let, and letting, constantly letting these policemen get away with it, but the one black cop that shot somebody, he's been in jail already. He was, he was arrested three days later. So 
the people in Minnesota want justice for a lot of things, and, and that's why they responded the way they did. It wasn't just because of my brother. It's because at least 10, 15 murders that the police have done that they haven't got justice for. And um, I think that's my biggest thing. I want justice, and, and once, I, once I can get justice for my brother, then it's to Breonna Taylor, it's, it's to Hardell Sherrell. It's a lot of cases that we haven't heard from, but it's opened a passion for me to use my voice, and uh, shit is working. So, um, I, but, but your question was what Minnesota people want. They just want justice. I think that's what everybody wants, to be treated equal. No, absolutely. And Breonna Taylor, that was a great point. Before we go to round out, because a lot of times, and I had a question about this, so we had to skip it. A lot of times it's underestimated the way that Black women are impacted. And I thought you brought up a great point, Stephen, about these mothers. You know, they leave them behind mothers. They leave them behind wives. They leave them behind Black children, Black wives, Black mothers. Um, and also, too, Black women are being affected by police violence and police brutality just as much. So it really is important. A lot of these conversations center on Black men, but it really is important to realize that, you know, we're a community and we're really going through this together. So wanted to uh, obviously acknowledge Breonna Taylor and the Sandra Blands of the world to know that this is an issue that all of us really can address. Um, so this has certainly been a lovely conversation. And like, like we talked about throughout this conversation, at the end of the day, it's about action. So we're gonna do a quick roundabout and we wanna hear from everybody. Um, two questions and you can make it quick, but what should the black people watching right now be doing to push change in our community? Um, and what should our allies who are also watching right now be doing to push change in the black community? I'll start, I'll start it off. Um, what, what should our allies do? They should be, we should continue to continue to hold them accountable and make them stand on the side of us. No more, like I said, no, no more social media support. No more, I, I say I support you from a phone call. They have to get out there and stand on the side with us and make their presence felt. Cause that, uh, I think that's what's making the change. Uh, what was your second question? What should the black people watching right now be doing the, in our community? The black people should be proud and should understand what moment we in. Um, there's so many people, like I said, I've talked to before me that, that was dying to see this day where we have their ear the way we do. Um, they have to understand what this moment is and what and what and understand what we need to do in this moment. Not just vote, but it's all kind of things that we need to do in this moment. I don't have all the answers, but they need to understand what this moment means. And uh, and I think I, and I think the youth youth is understanding because a lot of times you see when they they sending people out to to sabotage the protest, it's the youth that's exploiting them. It's the youth that's putting them on social media and stuff like that. So so um, just understand what moment we're in and how important it is. And I feel like to piggyback off of that, education is big, is huge on both sides. What I learned in school wasn't all the way true. What we all learned in school wasn't all the way true. And so just having that understanding, um, someone had mentioned early, earlier, Black people realizing how powerful we really are. Um, we've just been held down for so long, we don't realize that. And so obviously us using our platforms to give hope, to inform people. Um, but yeah, I think just education is huge. Yeah, I'll just say from the standpoint of our allies, they, they I, I think many are. That's why it's been two weeks. Uh, you see a lot of the marches. Some of them, many of them have lots of whites, Latinos, Asians, all marching for black lives. They're on message. They recognize that black lives are the most maligned and marginalized lives in America, along with indigenous folks. We are the most marginalized and maligned people in America. And the faces at the bottom of the well, if we can lift those, all, the one, all of them are going to come up. It's not white lives don't matter. It's not Latino and Asian lives don't matter. What black lives matter means is black lives matter also. Black lives matter too. That's all it's always meant, right? And people have tried to twist it and give it other meaning, but we haven't acted like those black lives matter too. So that's for allies, for black folks, for us, I, I would say, you know, we need to think that too and recognize that too. Um, when you look at what happened, um, you know, when I say that I see the underlying problem is black lives don't matter, Think about Hurricane Katrina, the Ninth Ward, those black people standing after Hurricane Katrina in the Ninth Ward with the water coming up to their neck. You remember that? And they, some of you, some of you were too young, but some of you kind of remember the water coming up to their neck on one day one, day two, day three, they're still coming up to the neck to stand there. Day four, Sean Penn is rowing up there, handing out fresh water because FEMA still couldn't get its act together four days in with those black bodies standing on those rooftops with water up to their neck. 
Compare that response to after 9-11 when those planes ran into those buildings. There was a panic of empathy for those victims. They just got it done. No days went by. They, 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 the cry of distress was a summons to relief for the whole nation. That, that is, that, at that level, you know, we don't have, the nation doesn't have the same panic for, of empathy for black lives. We have to have that panic of empathy for our own community within the black. We all we got at the end of the day. I'm glad for the, for the allies. I'm glad they're standing with us fighting with us, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you. But at the end of the day, we have to have that empathy because if we don't, no, really, at the end of the day, we're gonna be left like all those folks in the Ninth Ward after Hurricane Katrina. Mm. That's a great point. Yeah, to piggyback off that, um, I think our community needs to do whatever, whatever it is that you can do. Obviously, keep using your voice, keep pushing forward with the, the conversation, keep holding people accountable. If you can donate, keep donating. If you have an extreme amount of power and platform, keep pushing that, but also just go help your neighbors. Like it's to you can totally go volunteer, go down the skid row. There's lots of organizations that go down every single weekend, give out food, give out water, just give out good energy and love to the community that is really suffering. Our people suffering. It's free. You does it requires nothing but your time and your energy to go do that. So that to me is super important. I think that grassroots level work is super important to be out there in the community helping each other. As far as allies go, just do what you say you're going to do. It's, it's cool to put stuff on social media. It's important to have conversations with your families and friends, but also take action. If you have the ability to hire a black person for an executive position, do that. Just do that. Don't say that you're, you're making changes and our organization supports you. Do it. Do the work now. That's otherwise it's just noise and it's just for show, just for PR, like Matt said. And th nobody has time for that anymore. It, it's here. It's now. Do the work. I think um, for the black community, first and foremost, we have to unite for the first time and really mean it. There can't be a division. We all have to be on the same page, first and foremost. And then after that, it's got to be everybody versus racism. At the end of the day, you know, it, it's racism is wrong, and people finally see it now. So it's not necessarily. The one thing that these riots have brought is, is us together. You know, as Jody pointed out, you see every color of the rainbow out there protesting and it's a beautiful thing. You know, so we want to continue to keep that momentum. We need them to stand with us and next to us and hold people accountable when they're out of pocket. We need everyone to be able to hold everyone accountable. You know, love or hate is a top thing. So I don't know if it's ever going to go anywhere, but we just have to start calling it out more and holding people accountable. And then like Jack touched on, it's the work we're doing today it, this is not an easy fix. So what we have to continue to educate the youth and empower the youth, you know what I mean? Because they're the ones that are going to take it to the next level and probably our kids and their kids are going to actually finally see the real change. So right now we're laying the groundwork. This is history in the making and people have to understand that this shit's not going to change overnight, but we have to continue to stay on this and, but definitely empower this next group of, you know, my kids are 11, you know, and I'm starting to teach them politics. So start teaching them early, start teaching them the game and empowering them because they're, 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 they grow up with a lot more. You know, they grow up with the world at the palm of their hands. So they're, they're in the mix now. They're on the front lines now and they have our backs. So we have to continue to empower, uh, empowering them and educating them and, and hoping that, you know, one day that they're, they'll be able to see the benefits and their children will be able to see the benefits. Absolutely. And before we go... Yeah. I know we got Al, I know we got Baron left, I know we got James, but D, I want to ask, because you made a great point about how um, you, the MLB players are on their island. So in addition to what Black people can do, how, how can we show up for y'all in this MLB? You know, Man, like, it's crazy. So uh, the Mariners, we have the most Black people out of any roster since like the 70s. It's something crazy. We got 10 on the 40-man roster right now. 10 of the 62 is on the roster. And me being the most tenured one of them, I'm kind of looking after them. So uh, I was on a Zoom call with our ownership and we had a Black Voices round table earlier in the day. That's one of the reasons I was late. I proposed to the MLB that we should have a, a Black World Baseball Classic team just so the culture can follow us and see how much fun it is because you have to go to the Kansas City, you have to go to Kansas City just to see the Negro League Museum to know black baseball, to know how lit it was to play baseball, how fun it was, know that these guys were entertainers and ballers, just like my NBA brothers right here and the NFL guys. They don't know that anymore in this game. 
you know, I I train with NFL guys every day, and the first thing they look at me and be like, you play baseball, but I can do everything they can do as well. You know what I'm saying? So we have to get us back in it. And we propose that, and we're going to see what they do because the ball is in their court. That's a great idea. And again, you think about the Jackie Robinsons of the world. We have such a rich storied history in baseball. And for whatever reason, we have walked away from it. So love to see that come to life. All right, Al, let's hear from you because we ain't heard from you in a while. What what can the black folks call? What can our allies do? Yeah, you know, one of my things is like, you know, um, I just wish that our people like really, you know, educate themselves around group economics. You know what I mean? Um, what we fail to realize is like how powerful the black dollar is, right? You know, we always asking for reparations, but we already have, we have enough money, you know what I'm saying, that we circulate, you know, in the economy that we can, we can, we can change our future. You know what I'm saying? We can change our trajectory for real if we just decided to, you know, to everybody's point, unite and support one another first. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer, like, I, you know, I definitely support everything with the marches and changing, you know, changing things in po- political ways and stuff like that. But also, you know, at the end of the day, like, we need to have financial freedom as well. You know what I'm saying? And that's something that we have to constantly, you know, pay attention to because, you know, um, you know, we, we slave, we slaves because we don't have no bread. You know what I'm saying? Because we don't, we don't find a way to circumvent the money within our community, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's one thing that I would just, you know, challenge black people to really focus on and really understand and educate themselves around what group economics really means and just see if we can all just start to practice, you know, start practicing that with just a small percentage of our money just to start, you know what I'm saying? To be conscious, to use our money to, you know, continue to put into our community. You know, I think that that's something that could really help us. And then for the allies, I think it's, you know, you're beating a dead horse. It's just literally like, if you're a real ally and you mean it, you know, show us. You know what I'm saying? Don't just put it in a post. Don't just call my phone and say, Al, what can I do? And blah, 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 blah. You know, when we tell you, like, these are some action items that we need and these are call to actions, be there. Absolutely. And we're going to go to James and we're going to end with you, Bear, and we're going we gonna to round it out with you. James, Black folks, allies, what can they be doing to everybody listening? Well, first of all, I better get the invite for that uh, World Baseball Classic from the MLB. <laughs> so, I'll hey, be too late, too late, J Lo, you too late. <laughs> Just had the conversation today. Come on, man. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk about that another time. But uh, as far as the allies go, you know, I think it's continuing the conversation. You know, not letting this die down a month from now, two months from now. You know, bouncing ideas off each other. You know, seeing what else we can do. Um, Because we're going to still keep seeing people getting shot in the street. We're going to still keep seeing these things. So not being numb to it and, you know, still caring like we did for uh, for George Floyd. And then as far as the um, for the black folk, I think, you know, I think it's not fighting, you know, because, you know, we have the black lives matter and you have the all lives matter. Right. And I feel like, you know, it's like, oh, it's always this fight. It's always this big fight. And, And we know it's BS. You know, we know that. We know all lives matter. You know, I always, I always tell people like, you know, all cancers matter, but we have, we have breast cancer, right? Nobody's complaining that people are, are marching for breast cancer. Nobody's complaining. People are just trying to save the whales. We know, you know, all animals are important. So, you know, it's more focusing on us, focusing on the positive, focusing on the people that are trying to do great and, and, and um, not pay attention to the noise. Love it. All right, Baron, round us out. Um, one, thank everybody for participating. I mean, for me, this is, you know, our third year with business inside the game. And now to be able to have conversations like this and these conversations are, you know, for the people out there are, you know, these are people that can all help us right in our cause. So I'll, I'll start with our allies, right? Allies, make sure that your intent matches our purpose, right? And so when you are doing all the things that, you know, everyone has asked, make sure that what you intend to do is meaningful to our purpose and not something that you intend to do because you think it's beneficial and satisfying for you. So, you know, and then I would say next for us is to figure out 
our purpose, right? And how to build structure around our purpose, right? So when people intend to do things, right? Or if people want to do things, if they sign up to help, we can now build a structure and a place, right? That's purposeful and meaningful for, you know, us as a people. And that's financially, that's educationally, that's uh, institutionally. Um, and so if we are going to walk the walk at this point, talk the talk, you know, I think it's important for us to start to think about our greater purpose, right? And, you know, what does, what does the value of money place on the Black person in their journey and the history of America? And what real value, right, that money has that has been a part of our journey or a hindrance to our journey? And what have we overcome with the lack of that money, right, and the lack of those resources? So when we all think about that, let's think about, you know, what's flawed, right, and how do we fix it? And let's go find the right people to do it. Thank you, guys. That's my two cents. Thank you all. Thank you all of our great panelists. This was a great conversation. Um, seriously, let's figure out how we can continue to act. Um, thank you all for joining. And thank you all to everyone who watched and participated. We're closing it out at 8. 30 minutes over, but that's what we were aiming for. That was it. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much. Again, follow Big Summit. I don't know the exact social medias on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, but yeah, and there's more programming like this and tune in each week. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. You.